I just woke up with a dead guy. You got more serious problems than lousy lovers, believe me. No. I mean dead, Jackie. This man is cold. Jane Fonda wakes up from a drunken blackout one morning and finds herself in bed with a murdered man. Is she the killer or is she being framed? Well, that's the question she has to answer in the morning after one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film, The Morning After, has received, I think, some misleading advance word passed on or on about it. It's sort of been billed, at least it was to me, as Jane Fonda playing an alcoholic and sort of her version of the classic film, The Lost Weekend, when actually the movie that The Morning After is closest to in spirit is The Jagged Edge, a big thriller. Only secondarily does the issue of her character's alcoholism come through. And judged as a thriller, I found the morning after to be pretty bad. The thrills are totally predictable. For example, this early scene is Fonda waking up, as Roger said, from a drunken night. She's found a man's body next to her. He's dead. So she cleans up the apartment, doesn't call the police, of course. And as she's leaving the apartment, she realizes that somebody else might be in the room, in the closet. That scene continues. She backs out the door, and guess what? Yes, the moment we think she's safe from the guy in the closet, whoever's in the closet, yes, just at that moment she thinks she's safe, yes, somebody grabs her. Surprise, surprise, surprise. It's, but, again, another surprise. The person that grabs her, it's not a killer, it's a friend. Well, I've seen that repetitive sequence of safety, fear, safety, fear, I've seen that scene so many times in so many low-rent movies like the Friday the 13th series that I was really surprised to see it in a supposed quality film like this. This film also has a romantic angle with Jeff Bridges playing a burnt-out cop who decides to help Fonda solve the mystery of the dead man's body. He also takes a liking to her, of course. No surprises this time either. How'd you get disabled? My arm was a funny incident. Really let it all hang out, don't you? Okay, I got stabbed by a little hooker. Fourteen years of age. Anyway, she must have uh, must have got some nerves up here. I can't draw my weapon right anymore. Feels awkward. Maybe you just got tired of being a cop. Oh, are you kidding? That was the best job I ever had. I've said this for years, that Jeff Bridges has one of the best track records of being in quality movies. He's a terrific actor, but I think he's made a mistake this time, because The Morning After is nowhere near the level of Bridges' last thriller, Jagged Edge. No surprises this time, just lots of plot holes in The Morning After. And as for Jane Fonda's character as an alcoholic, well, she may do a very good job, but I think it's thrown away in a bad movie. Well, I agree with you that the plot is no good. In fact, there were holes in this plot so big that you could drive another movie through them. It's, a, In fact, the contradictions, including, for example, the, the whole business of how they're going to get rid of the bloody oh. sheets and why the police didn't find them there, how the body got in her shower, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. Forget it. Why they didn't rewrite the plot of this movie from beginning to end, I don't understand. I don't either. Yet, I recommend the movie oh my God. marginally because of the performances. Jane Fonda and Jeff Bridges. Interesting, especially Jane Fonda. Reaching here, creating a character who is very interesting. Sure. Also, lots of, me of minor supporting performances. Very interesting. This is a case where the people came to work and they did their best and they did good enough 
for me to recommend the movie even though the screenwriter let them totally down. Well, Roger, I think if we have to rank things that are important in movies, I would say that in a thriller, the script is by far the most important thing, and it's a washout. But don't you think, agree. Gene, it's quite valid in order to talk about... For example, last week you were saying you liked all of Eddie Murphy's stuff in America and none of his stuff right. in Asia. And okay. I voted thumbs down Okay, I like the performance here even when I don't like what's being done in the screenplay. Isn't I that heard just as valid? It's valid what you think. I just think your vote's off. That's okay. Well, you make that's... mistakes before. Don't worry about it. No, this is not going to be my uh, last, I'm sure. Okay. It's not according to you. Next movie. Our next <laughs> movie is named Native Son, and this is the film version of a heartbreaking American classic by Richard Wright, the story of a black teenager on Chicago's South Side more than 50 years ago and how he's charged with the murder of a rich white girl. The circumstantial evidence against this kid is damning, and he's so inarticulate, there's no way for him to explain how the tragic chain of events got started. Victor Love stars as the young man named Bigger Thomas, and in this scene he learns about his new employers from the maid played by Geraldine Page. You know, Mr. Dalton's done a lot for you. My people? Oh, yes, the colored. He's given over a million dollars to colored schools. Elizabeth McGovern plays the daughter of the family, and her boyfriend played by Matt Dillon. They're both left-wingers. They make a point of treating Bigger Thomas like an equal, and he grows very uncomfortable. Bigger, I want you to meet Jan. Jan, this is Bigger Thomas. How are you, Bigger? Fine, sir. First of all, you don't have to call me sir. I'm Jan and you're Bigger. He means that, Bigger. Listen, uh, why don't you let me drive for a while? No. No, it's okay. Uh, I mean, I can't... <laughs> Mr. Dalton said I'm supposed to drive the car. It's all right, Bigger. The girl gets drunk, Bigger takes her to her bedroom, and afraid to be found with her there, he accidentally smothers her to death. In a panic, he stuffs the body into the family's furnace, and later, reporters seeking news of the girl's disappearance discover her remains. Bigger is charged with murder, and here his mother pleads for forgiveness from the dead girl's blind mother. Please, I know I ain't got no place with you. I know, but please, ma'am, don't let them kill my boy. Please, ma'am, I know you are mother and you just lost your daughter. Please, ma'am, don't let them kill my boy. That's Carol Baker as the victim's mother, and Oprah Winfrey is Bigger's mother, and Winfrey gives a very strong performance in this movie. So does Victor Love, a young actor in his first big movie role. Native Son is very tough material to deal with because we're being asked to understand why a young man would be so careless as to accidentally kill someone, and the reason is his very real fear is almost paralytic fear more than 50 years ago what might have happened if he were found in the bedroom of that white girl that he was only trying to help. The real tragedy of Native Son is that by the end of the story, Bigger Thomas has grown into a person who can understand and forgive. He's no longer paralyzed by his fears, which were caused by racism. But by then, of course, it's too late for him. This is a strong and a bitter movie. Well, I thought it was strong and bitter at the beginning and at the end. Very strong in its opening scene, a beautiful scene of a rat running around an apartment and we see Bigger's conditions and, his, and then the rat might as well stand for racism and it was a very evocative scene. At the end, I think you've hit the most beautiful part of the movie, is when we see that Bigger has a conversation with uh, his attorney and he mm -hmm. explains to him the conflicts were within him and he is quite enlightened about it. In between for me, the movie sagged as drama. We're dealing with a period book and the whole business of putting the body in the furnace uh, almost came off as unintended comedy. I thought it was very badly directed. And so mm -hmm. this American tragedy, of course, I think is rendered badly by simply the direction of this story. Oh, I the didn't... The mechanics of the story. I didn't think it came off as comedy at all. This The whole chain of events, which leads Not to Not comedy, fact, but comic. Well, I wasn't yeah. laughing anyway. It yeah. seemed to me that his desperation... Here is a guy oh, who was totally uh, in, out of, his, out of his element, in a world in which he doesn't know how this happened, he doesn't know what to do, no. he's desperate, he's blind with fear, no. and the, the, the gruesomeness of shoving that body into the furnace yeah. is... It's is, actually more gruesome in the novel. If you remember, he cuts her head off. I mean, it really gets quite wild, and there's even mm -hmm. a scene where he uh, threatens to, or kills his girlfriend uh, that we, is taken out of the movie. I mean, the book's even more gruesome. I just felt that the treatment of this material, which is so strong, wasn't done well enough. Well, I disagree. Coming up next, Neil Simon, the most successful playwright in Broadway history, takes a look back at his days growing up in Brooklyn in Brighton Beach Memoirs. You can't marry your first cousin. You get babies with nine heads. Our next film is Brighton Beach Memoirs, based on the Neil Simon superb play about his days of growing up as a kid in Brooklyn. His young alter ego loves baseball, loves writing, 
loves keeping a diary, but hates just about everything else in his life, including putting up with his nagging mother, played by Blythe Danner. Hey, hey, shoes on the bed. That's bad luck in a Jewish house. It's not a Jewish house. It was built by Italians. You are looking to get it for me. I need Swiss cheese. Go to Greenblatt's. Now? No, next to you when I'm dead. That wasn't too original. Now, the best scenes in the movie involve young Eugene's passions in life. In this case, his incredible desire, insatiable desire to see a girl naked. Eugene, your father wants you to go to the store. Damn. Tell him I'm sick. Tell him I have diarrhea. You don't want any ice cream? Ice cream? Wait a minute. You want some ice cream, Stan? No. I have no willpower. Am I gonna be a writer unless I suffer? Actually, I'd give up writing if I could see a naked girl while I was eating ice cream. That's funny, but then the movie returns to the nagging, and the movie turns into, I'm afraid, one long whine. The oatmeal cookie in your pocket. Put it on the table. You can smell an oatmeal cookie from ten feet away? I heard the jar moving in the kitchen. Suddenly, everybody is doing what they want in this house. Your father's upset, Aunt Blanche is upset, Nora is upset. Put the cookie on the table! That was newcomer Jonathan Silverman playing Eugene Morris Jerome, the young Neil Simon, and he's at a terrible disadvantage, for me at least, because he's playing a role that was played on stage so beautifully by the very talented Matthew Broderick, who would later become a movie star. I saw the play, and while there's no comparison between the two lead young actors, and what's missing from the movie also, I found, is the sense of stress within the family of two families sharing the same house, Eugene's family and his aunt and her daughter. There was real passion in the play about the stresses on the working class. Here, there's just one little scene as the filmmakers go, more for laughs. The movie misses for me. My recommendation, see the play as it moves around the country, because this film version of a play that I love just doesn't have it. And here I'm in agreement with you, and I also like the play, and I like Matthew Broderick, and Jonathan oh, Silverman, spectacular. he might be good in another movie, he might have a great career ahead of him, he's wrong in this role, he never really got me involved in his, I never really shared his, no. his passions, his interests, his life in this film. Also, I don't think Blythe Danner was exactly born to play a Jewish mother, I don't mm -hmm. think that she had the energy and the... No, she uh, just comes out and whines. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not convincing. Also, the, the play itself as a play seemed to work so much better. In the, in the movie, some of the same things. For example, when he lowers his voice, because you never say the name of a disease right. in a lot, so you say diarrhea. Uh, in, in the movie, it yeah. comes across as, as writing by the numbers. I just yeah. felt as if, the play, as, the, as if the movie was just marching along step by step to a predetermined destination. But you've got to put it on Broderick. I mean, Broderick yeah. in that play was spectacular. Mm -hmm. it, I, I just haven't seen a great young performance like that. And also, the pathos. I think they chickened out a little bit in the movie and wanted mm -hmm. to make it more of an entertainment when the play works so well as both high comedy and high drama. So I guess two thumbs down. When we come back, we'll look at a documentary about a woman that some people believe is a living saint. Her name is Mother Teresa. Lord, make me a channel documentary named Mother Teresa, and it goes a long way toward explaining why this quiet, simple old woman has become one of the most loved and respected people in the world. For one thing, find out in this movie, she's not so quiet and simple. <laughs> she comes across in this film as an intelligent, determined, and sometimes very funny woman who was born in Albania, the child of rich parents, yeah. uh, oddly enough. She moved to India as an ordinary teaching nun and only got her vocation to help the poor when she was well into her 30s. In the film, we see that the order she founded, the Missionaries of Charity, really do work and live among the poor. God's love is infinite, full of tenderness, full of compassion. God loves the world through us, you and me. The way you touch people, the way you give to people, that love for one another. The movie does a wonderful job of capturing Mother Teresa's humanity and her sense of humor. Somebody asked me, what will you do when there'll be no more poor in the world? And I said, we'll be unemployed. 
You know, I have a confession to make, and I, I guess I might as well make it. I'm one of those people who's been reading for years and years about Mother Teresa in the paper without ever having any clear idea of exactly who she was, the famous Mother Teresa, whoever that is, I right? I, Roger, there have been parodies of her, you know, on Saturday Night Live, you see this uh -huh. little woman and they make jokes about her. And, you know, you almost think she doesn't exist. I mean, it's something made up, some miracle. Gandhi's sister. I that's why I was so happy to see this documentary, because it answered a lot of my questions in a very interesting way. I even have to confess that until this movie, I didn't even know she was Albanian. I thought she was an Indian. I mean, yeah. to the degree that I thought about it at all. But what I saw in this film was a woman who was not only idealistic and, I must use this word, saintly, but also a very practical and well-organized person, a natural leader, whose vision is so clear and concentrated that she started an international movement with almost literally no financial resources. Mm -hmm. Big business could study this movie for lessons for Mother Teresa in organization and management. This movie was filmed over five years on six continents by two sisters, Anne and Jeanette Petrie, and their film is not only inspirational, but I found it absolutely fascinating. Well, what is a document supposed to do? Give us information. And boy, this gave us a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I, I took notes while I was watching this mm -hmm. thing, and she has a fabulous thing about her, you talk about her drive, mm -hmm. which is the thing we don't think. We think there's just a saintly little woman, you know, who leads by just being quiet. Mm -hmm. She says at one point, I had to write it down, she's talking to some of the people working for her. She says to these young uh, people who are going to start to work for her, if you don't have that zeal, pick up and go home. No need to stay. Mm -hmm. I mean, she could, she could be Lee Iacocca talking to, the, <laughs> talking to the Chrysler plant and saying, if you can't produce, get out. Mm -hmm. And so you see the full woman here. You see tragic scenes of her helping people and reaching and touching mm -hmm. the people that no one else will touch. Mm -hmm. And she talks about sacrificing, giving yourself over, turning yourself over, even means cutting yourself up to pieces. She talks so beautifully and strongly. It is what you also get in the film is an idea of the movement that she has started, the order that she has founded, because it's not simply Mother Teresa kind of, you know, posing for a postage stamp. It's all of the women who have joined with her and the real work that they're doing, which I found very impressive. In not raising movie. money, doing work is the concept. That's right. Coming up next, our special home video segment, two recommendations, one from Japan, one about a bomb that could destroy the world. Now it's time for our weekly home video segment where we recommend newly released films available for renting in your own home. And my pick this week is a superior Japanese film by the great director Akira Kurosawa. His film called Ran, R-A-N, based in part on the King Lear legend of an old warlord who was unable to pass his kingdom on to his children. War breaks out among the three sons in Ran, and one of the film's most striking yet simple images, the old lord sits motionless while his empire is under attack. That's a magnificent scene. Only a master filmmaker like Kurosawa would have the wisdom to know that less is more, that keeping the Lord silent and stationary would be more effective than if you were running around screaming in response to the arrows and all the fighting. Don't be put off by the fact that it's a foreign film. The story of Ran is universal. And you know, it's probably a story that's also very personal to Kurosawa, who is himself very old now and in infirm health. And this, it's almost, it's for example, Olivier did King Lear on the stage. Right. Kurosawa does it as a film. I guess when you get to a certain age, the story of King Lear means a lot to you personally. Either you want to keep your family together, or I have the feeling with uh, Kurosawa, is he almost wants to keep the Japanese film industry together, which he has seen sort of crumble a little bit around him. Well, not support him. it's a very good film. My choice at the video store this week, in addition to RAN, which I would certainly recommend, yep. is a movie named The Manhattan Project, which came out earlier this year and kind of got lost at the box office, even though it is one of the smartest and funniest thrillers of the year. The movie stars John Lithgow as a nuclear scientist and Christopher Callot as a very bright kid who sneaks into his lab and steals everything he needs to construct his own nuclear weapon. Paul, we know it's not on, Paul. So I want you to just put it down and walk away. Walk away? That's right. I'm going to count to three. The Manhattan Project was written and directed by Marshall Brickman, who's worked on a lot of Woody Allen pictures, and it shows a real quickness in the dialogue and the storytelling. This is a bright movie about a bright kid, and by the end of the movie, the kid has just about outsmarted everyone into starting World War III. The Manhattan Project is lots of fun. It is lots of fun. It works as a good little thriller. John Lithgow turns in another one of his good performances. Mm -hmm. He's very valuable. Maybe they should have used that kid Christopher Collett in the uh, uh, Neil Simon play, because that would have been good. I still think if I can go back to that film, because I'm still <laughs> angry about it, I wanted it to be so good. They should have gone and used Mar uh, Matthew Broderick. They didn't, because they thought he was too old. It would have worked. 
Well, uh, we could also go back to last week's show. I have a few notes I'd also like to make, but in the meantime, Manhattan Project and yes. Iran, right, for a video. Okay, now let's recap our reactions to the movies on this show. Roger and I split on the morning after. I thought it was a dumb, predictable thriller. Roger thought that Jane Fonda's and Jeff Bridges' performances more than made up for the film's many faults. One thumb up, one down. We also split on Native Son, the black drama. Roger found it quite moving as a whole. I appreciated only about two scenes. Again, one thumb up, one down. We finally agreed on Brighton Beach Memoirs. The Neil Simon play turned into a movie. The lead performances were weak. The jokes were not compensated by the bittersweet living conditions. Two thumbs down. And finally, we both appreciated the documentary on the amazing life of Mother Teresa, an inspiring story for the holiday season. A well-made documentary about one of the most charitable spirits of our time. Two thumbs up. So the one we both agree on is Mother Teresa, which is opening city by city around the country. You might want to look for it wherever you live. Right. Next week, we're going to do one of our favorite shows of the year. We're each going to select our personal lists of the year's 10 best films. And then I'm going to explain to Gene all of the movies that ought to be on his list and are not. Yeah, That'll be next try. week. Until then, the balcony is closed. <laughs>